to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Welcome to our study on soul-saving lessons of how to overcome a sinful past. The Bible is God's message on how to overcome sin. In Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered into the world, God from that point forward in Scripture began to reveal His plan to overcome sin through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to know that the Bible is the great how-to book. Men have written how-to do books on everything you can imagine. In fact, someone recently said there are over 3,200 how-to books written by men. And yet God wrote one how-to book and it's how to overcome sin. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 tells us that according to His divine power, God has given to us how to overcome sin, all things for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. This book is the how-to book on how to live the best life and be a godly person. In fact, the Bible tells us how not just to get by, not just to survive, not just to barely make it, the Bible tells us how to overcome. It takes us from victim to victor. We go from losing the battle to sin in Genesis 3 to ultimately reigning with God in heaven in Revelation chapter 21. I love the words of 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 54. In this passage, Paul, by inspiration, illustrates how we can have the ultimate victory over death. Notice these beautiful words. The scripture says, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. What a wonderful thought to know that as I obey the gospel, as I live a Christian life, as I strive to overcome sin, death can no longer haunt me. It can be swallowed up in the victory that we have. This is the victory that we have even our faith. 1 John 5 verse 4. Our victory is made possible because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. And it is God who always leads us in triumph or victory in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. As we think about the victory in the battle, let's understand that we are in a serious battle against the devil and against sin. And yet in the scripture, we are clearly told how to overcome the devil in sin. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, the scripture says, They, first century Christians, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. How did they defeat the devil then? How can we do it today? The blood of Christ, Scripture, and self-sacrifice. If we're going to win the battle, we've got to contact the blood of Jesus. If we're going to stay faithful, we've got to commit to the Scriptures. And if we're going to win, we've got to be convicted of the need to sacrifice ourselves for the cause of Christ daily. And you can be sure, if you do those things, you will have the victory. Notice again the beautiful words of 1 Corinthians 15 and this time verse 57. Look at what the scripture says. Thanks be to God, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God, Paul says, that we have the victory through Jesus. And so yes, we can overcome, we can be victors, we can win the battle, but let's also realize that every one of us
has a past we must deal with. This is a practical lesson because each of us has to deal with a past of sin. John chapter 8, like the proverbial woman who was caught in sin in the, at the well, so today we also have sin that we must deal with. We're, if we're amenable to God's law, that is, if we're of an accountable mind, Isaiah 7 verse 16, and if we're of an accountable age, we need to make sure that we deal with the sin problem. You know, the, the important thing to realize is there are some things we can some things we can and must do to overcome sin. I understand God has done His part. Matthew 1 21, the scripture tells us of Jesus, you will call His name Jesus, which is translated God with us. He will deliver His people from their sins. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Matthew 11 verse 28, I know God has done His part. I've got to do my part. And part of Overcoming sin is realizing God says it's possible. We're not defeatist. The scripture teaches us this is a possibility, it's a reality. I can overcome sin. I want you to notice the words of Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. To Cain, who had murdered his brother Abel, God made this statement. He said to him, If you do well, Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. Notice this though, but you shall rule over it. One version says, you shall master it. God has not created me to be mastered by sin. God has created me to master sin. I have the power through Jesus Christ, through the Word of God, to not let sin rule my life, but to rule over sin. And so this is a possibility. It's something that we can achieve. If that's the case, what must I do to overcome a sinful past? First, you must recognize and admit sin in your life. Someone has stated, to know yourself diseased is half the cure. There's an important statement there, important truth there to learn, and that is, I'll never overcome sin until I realize it's personal to me. I have sin. Luke chapter 15, verses 17, verse 20, as the prodigal son is dealing with his prodigal ways, he's in the pig pen, he comes to himself and he says, Father, I've sinned. I'll go back to my father's house and I'll say, I've sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be a son. Make me a servant. And he went to the father and he said, Father, I have sinned. Each person who is going to deal with sin must recognize and admit it in his life. I want you to notice the words of Romans 3. This is a universal problem. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, look at what the scripture says. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here's something I can learn from that. If all, then I. If all have sinned, then I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 10 says, There's none righteous, no, not one. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says, even the most righteous have to deal with sin. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 26 through 29. And so recognize, I've got a sin problem I must deal with. You've got to be big enough to admit sin in your life. You know, there are some examples in the Bible of people who did that. Some were too late, some were not. Luke chapter 18, You've got the example of the, the rich man and the publican, uh, the Pharisee. He goes up and he's at the temple of God. He's praying, God, I thank you I'm not like other men. And as you read that context, he's a pious, uh, prideful man. But the publican, he won't even so much as uh, look to, up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We need to realize sin is something we all have to deal with. Saul said it. I've sinned. I've erred exceedingly. I've played the fool. 1 Samuel 26, verse 21. David said, I have sinned. Achan said it, I've sinned. He was too late to say that because he and his whole family were burned. But we've got to admit sin if we're going to deal with the problem. You can say, yeah, sin's a universal problem, but make it personal. 
I have sinned. I've got a problem. I need God's help in dealing with it. Notice the words of 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, and how this applies to recognizing and admitting our sin. The scripture says, If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. Now, if we say that we have not sinned, we make Him, God, a liar, and the truth is not in us. How does this apply? Not only do I have to recognize it, if I'm going to be faithful to God, I've got to admit it, I've got to repent, and I've got to take steps to deal with the sin problem. And so first, to overcome a sinful past, recognize and be big enough to admit, I've got sin in my life, I need to deal with it. Secondly, to overcome a sinful past, you've got to be ashamed of sin. Be ashamed of sin because of, of what it does to God. Ezekiel 6 and verse 9, it breaks the heart of God. It's that which will cause man to be lost. Jesus said there's a place where the worm never dies and the fire's not quenched. God doesn't want anybody to go there. We don't want anybody to go there, but people will go there if they're not ashamed enough of sin to turn from it. Does the scripture teach that we should be ashamed of sin? Or does the scripture teach that once we have our sins dealt with, we can brag about it like we were really big and bad then? No, look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 21. The scripture says, What fruit did you have in those things, notice, of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. What fruit did you get in that which you're now ashamed? Are we ashamed enough of sin to really put it behind us? Are you ashamed of sin? I've heard Christians, even parents, almost speak about sin as though they were bragging. Now, you ought not to do this, but when I was your age, I could do such and such in sin, or I was really good at this sin, or I was the best there was at it. That's not the mindset we ought to have about sin. How should we view sin? Sin ought to cause us to blush. Notice the words of Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15. The scripture says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Well, what happened to these people who weren't ashamed? God said, you don't change your ways, you're going into captivity. They didn't change their ways, and they went into harsh Babylonian captivity. To people who will not be ashamed of sin, there is a greater captivity coming than that of the Babylonians. God has promised they will spend eternity in hell bound in the chains of darkness with the angels of the devil and the devil himself. We need to be ashamed of sin because it is against the will of God, it breaks the heart of God, and it makes a mockery of what Jesus did. Hebrews 10 verse 26 following says that those who after they've obeyed the gospel continue in a life of sin, they're in essence trampling upon the body of Jesus Christ. It makes a mockery of what Jesus did on the cross. And so recognize and admit sin. Be big enough to be ashamed of it, want to put it behind you, and then you've got to be ready to deal with sin in a God-approved way. You know, there are some ways in Scripture that people tried to deal with the sin problem but weren't successful because they didn't do it God's ways. Here are some ways not to deal with sin. You can't run from your sin problem. I don't care how fast you can run, how far you can run, you can't run fast enough or far enough to run away from the sin problem. How do we know that? Think about Jonah. God said to Jonah, get on a ship, go to Nineveh, and you preach to those people. Jonah hated the Ninevites. And Jonah got on a ship and went the opposite way. He thought he could get away from God. It wasn't till he found himself in the belly of the great fish that he said and realized, I can't get away from God. We need to realize you cannot, you cannot run from sin. No matter how fast you are and no matter how far you can run, sin will always be with you. You can't dismiss, dismiss sin flippantly. There was a man in Scripture who tried to. 
Acts chapter 24, Paul is preaching to Felix about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And Felix, in essence, says, go away. When I've got a more convenient time, I'll call upon you. You can't dismiss sin flippantly. We're talking about the most serious matter you can ever imagine. You can't just justify your sin in yourself and say, everything's going to be okay. You've got to realize this will cost me my soul. And you can't deal with sin by living in it and acting like it doesn't exist. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11 says, These people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Adulterers, idolaters, homosexuals, sodomites, immoral, the ungodly will not go to heaven. And if I've got sin in my life, I won't go to heaven either. Well, how then do we deal with sin? You initially deal with sin by obeying the gospel. What do we mean by that? You first of all have to hear the Word of God. You've got to be willing to recognize this book tells me how to deal with a sin problem and whatever it says, I must do it. Matthew 17 verse 5 on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus or the voice of God came down from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. We must hear the Word of God. We must believe that Jesus is God's Son. Without belief, we won't be saved. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And I have to have faith to be pleasing to God. Hebrews 11 verse 6, Without faith, it's impossible. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is traveling down the road. Uh, Philip is teaching the gospel. He comes to a certain water. You've been talking about it. Here's water. What does hinder me? Do you remember the hindrance? If you believe with all your heart, you may. You must hear God's Word. You must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. You must repent of sin to be right with God. In Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 5, certain Jews come to Jesus to tell about people who it looks like have committed some heinous sins and thus the, the, the judgment of God has come against them. You've got these people, they had their blood mingled with their sacrifice and they said to Jesus, weren't these worse sinners than all others? What about these 18 people who are walking down the road and this tower out of nowhere falls on them? Weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? You know what Jesus said in verse 3 and verse 5? Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Stop thinking about the sin of others, in essence, he said, and you deal with your own sin problem. To be saved, you also must confess the name of Jesus. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And once I've made that good confession, then I need to be immersed in water to have my sins washed away. So many people think they've dealt with the sin problem and yet they haven't even had their sins washed away. Look at what the scripture teaches about baptism. Notice Acts 22 and verse 16. The scripture says, and now, this is the conversion of Saul, now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What did Paul, Saul have to do to have his sins washed away and to deal with a sinful past? He was told, get up, be baptized. And what happened there at the point of baptism? Wash away your sins, calling on the Lord on the name of the Lord. A lot of people say, well, all you've got to do to be saved is call on the name of the Lord. Acts 2.21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's true, but how do you call on the name of the Lord? Acts 22.16 is the divine commentary. You get up and obey what God says concerning baptism, and baptism is the point at which one contacts the blood of Jesus and has his sins washed away. Well, what if I am a Christian and I've had my sins washed away? How do I continue to overcome a sinful past? Not only must you obey God's plan of salvation, you must learn from the past. If you're going to continue to overcome sin, you've got to learn from the past. What do you think the prodigal son learned? Here's what he learned. I don't ever want to go back into a life of sin. It is always better to be in the Father's house. How true that is. The book of Hebrews is all about 
making sure that we don't go back. Hebrews 3 verse 12 tells us we've got to encourage one another daily lest the deceitfulness of sin overtake us. Don't go back. You've got it so much better right now as a Christian. Don't ever go back to a life of sin. It's always better to have past sins as a teacher than present sins as a master. You need to learn from the past and say, I don't ever want to go back into that. Romans 6 verses 17 and 18 says, God be thanked that though we were the slaves of sin, yet we obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which we were delivered, and having been set free from sin, we became slaves of righteousness. We were slaves of sin. We learned the lesson. We obeyed the gospel. And it's always better to have past sins as a teacher than present sins as a master. Have you learned the lesson from sin? Maybe you used to use alcohol. Have you learned how hard of a life that is? The way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs 13 verse 15. Have you begun to realize the mockery that that makes of you? Proverbs 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is, wise, is not wise. Maybe you used to use language that was ungodly. Have you learned the damage that can do to your reputation? The damage that can do to your purity of life? Maybe you were caught up in religious error. Have you realized how, how destructive that error is, how important it is to make sure we stay with the Bible and only do what God tells us to do. Uh, we need to learn from past sins and never go back into them. Now, here's the key. If as a child of God, I've obeyed the gospel, I've learned from past sins, what do I need to do now to overcome that sinful past? Sometimes I talk to people and and they're Christians and they have the, the, the blessing of being a Christian, but you can look at them and they're still struggling with that past of sin. You've got to learn to forget the past. Now there's a problem. Sometimes it's hard to forget the past. David in 2 Samuel 11 and 12 had committed adultery of Bathsheba. He had her husband murdered. They had a, a son from that ungodly union and that son died because of it. And David admitted and realized how hard it is sometimes to forget the past. Look at his words in Psalm 51 verses 3 and 4. The Word of God says, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me against you you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Uh, David says, I've sinned against you and I know I have and I want to make it right. Yes, sometimes it's hard to forget the past, but realize this, if God can forget and forgive, so must I. Paul had done some pretty bad things in his life. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Paul, Paul, Paul felt, I am chief of sinners. He knew he had done heinous things against the cause of Christ and against servants of God. In Acts uh, 6, he's, uh, 7, he's holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Acts 8, he's wreaking havoc on the church. Acts 9, he's headed to drag men and women to prison. And yet Paul could say, forgetting those things which are behind. I want you to look at Philippians chapter 3. I believe this is the key to overcoming a sinful past. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. What does the scripture say? The Bible says, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Paul said, I press on. Here's Paul's mindset. Forget those things which are behind. Yes, you may have done things that were ungodly, things that were immoral, things that were against the law. But if you have repented and changed your will, you've been forgiven. Micah 7 verses 18 and 19, the scripture says God will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103 verses 10 through 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Jesus, as he instituted the Lord's Supper, said, This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for many for the remission of sins. The Bible says for the Christian who changes his life and repents,
all things are new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Listen, old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. It's as though the chalkboard has been erased. The slate is wiped clean. If I obey the gospel, if I repent, and if I live faithful, it's been wiped away. I no longer can be haunted by that sin. John 8 verse 32 when Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free it makes us free from sin and free from the consequences. Now this is important because those who live in the past are often doomed to repeat its mistakes. If you live in the past if you don't ever overcome that and you continually live in the past you may be dooming yourself to a life of misery and you may eventually repeat those things. You've got to say to yourself, if I've obeyed the gospel, if I've changed my life, God has forgiven me, God has forgot it, and so I must too forgive myself and forget those things. Are you sure today that you have overcome a sinful past? Have you been willing to recognize and admit sin in your life? Have you decided to deal with sin in a God-approved way? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? The Bible teaches again that you must hear the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17, you must believe that Jesus is God's Son. John chapter 8 verse 24, you must be willing to repent, turn from sin and turn to God. Luke 13 3, making the good confession that Jesus is the Son of God Romans 10 verse 10, and you must be baptized in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Now if you've done those things, you can know that you are a child of God. And if after being a child of God you've sinned, do like Simon. Acts 8 verse 20, repent and pray and God will forgive you as you change your life. And may each of us make a determined effort to overcome sin. We can master it. The question is, Will we overcome a sinful past? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.